So just watching volume profile, I, you know, you can see, you can see in stocks too, right? Like it's, it's moving, let's just say, and they're trading 10,000 shares trades, 20,000 shares trade, uh, you know, 15,000 shares trade. And it just keeps going, blank, 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 blank. And then suddenly it hits a price and 250,000 shares trade. And, and, and magically price stops going up. Mm-hmm. Well, price stops going up because somebody just unloaded a quarter million shares, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm so flexible. Like I'm just waiting to see that. Or I, I mean, it can still go through there. But the point is, if you're trying to do this risk to reward, not you, but somebody, you know, three to one or two to one, and my target is 10 points, or my target is 12 points, you're completely dismissing the information being given to you in the volume profile, which is showing you, all right, yeah, it is moving through these prices really easily. There's no one there, the offers aren't there. Suddenly somebody is, is willing to sell a quarter million shares. Well, well, who's willing to sell a quarter million shares and why? And now how will that probably affect this, this movement? Mm-hmm. And so if it happens to be a time when I think it'll turn based on that, then I'll flip and go short. And if, I, if I'm not really sure if it's a little choppy, I'll just get out, sit on the sidelines. But I'm, I'm responding, which is what scalpers and really what all traders should be doing. You're responding yeah. to what you see rather than thinking you know something yeah. that you don't know, right? Everybody, welcome to a new episode. Before we get started, make sure you show a little love. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to the channel and hit the thumbs up button. If you're on Apple Podcasts, make sure you leave us a review, any other platform that you're on, whatever the love looks like, show a little, and then let's get started. Mr. No BS Day Trade, how are you? I'm well, Aaron, how are you? I, yeah. Where, I mean, uh, where are you calling from? I'm in uh, Winter Park, Colorado, actually, at the moment. Oh, very nice. You, you, now, you don't live out there, do you? I don't, I live in Florida. Um, uh-huh. But I usually vacation out here in the summers. I do a lot of mountain biking. So awesome. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, and I appreciate the invite. I just, I figured it was better to go ahead and catch up with you this month because it might be a few more weeks before I could get with you. So, well, I'm very glad you did as well. And uh, just by way of introduction, I'll mm-hmm. say this for everybody who's listening. Uh, since we started doing these conversations and bringing people on just to, to chat with them, um, most of the time when somebody comes on, I don't know who they are, really. Uh, I'll look into them a little bit before the call, but it's usually just somebody that is, you know, just a trader or, or, or just somebody on YouTube. And um, when no BS day trading was uh, in the works and, and you were talking with Ruben to come on, um, I didn't put together who you were. And I was like, okay, great, fine. And then as soon as I started looking into you, I was like, I know exactly who you are. And, uh, and, and John Grady, it all came back. And I was like, oh my goodness. And so uh, I say that to say as well, normally when we kick off these conversations, we kind of just dick around a little bit and uh, get to know each other for a few minutes. Um, and, and having you on, I'm very excited to be talking with you. I'm very excited that you made the time out. And for anybody who is listening to this, um, you're one of the very few people that I will have known about, and I have watched your stuff, uh, even to the point of having helped open my eyes to, to certain aspects of trading. And so it's very cool to have you on. And it was a very cool surprise because I didn't know it was you until uh, actually very, very recently. So I'm oh, well, uh, very excited that you're here. Um, well, thank it's not you. a great introduction about who you are at all. But all right. um, let me, if we could, to kind of just jump into things, because I do feel like um, there's actually a lot of value and I'm very excited just to be able to ask you questions and I don't wanna uh, maybe waste too much time just talking. Um, could you start us off just by giving a little bit of an introduction about you, maybe your background? Um, I'll kind of jump in and if there's anything to unpack, but it has been years since I've, I've heard anything about you or from you. So I don't think I even know specifically what you're up to nowadays. Um, so maybe you could just start there with a, a little intro for yourself. Sure, sure. Uh, I'll give you the condensed version here. Um, just for people who don't, who don't know me. <clears throat> I'm a classic product of, I was thinking about this last night, of, of basically a kid watching Wall Street back in the day. Like, I don't know how old you are, but I'm, I'm in my 40s. 32. Okay, so I'm in my 40s. <clears throat> and so the short of it is that when I was younger, I, got, I became enamored with um, trading pretty much, you know, as a kid, 
sort of knew that's what I wanted to do. Uh, one of my mom's friends was married to a stockbroker. They were, you know, very well off. And so I spent quite a few years trying to get a job in the industry. And ultimately, um, I had a brief job at an equities firm. And it wasn't really well funded, like the broker, it was started by a broker, and he didn't really know what he was getting himself into at the time. How old were you during this time when you were first getting into this? 24. Okay. Yeah, so I so my first prop job was when I was 24. And <clears throat> it was equities. So it was my first introduction to um, a level two platform at the time, it's going way back, obviously. And we, I was around some guys that had made some money. And, you know, when you when you don't know anything much about it, <clears throat> you don't really understand what they're looking at, like when you're looking at the level two stuff. Sure. Um, so that went away quickly because they closed the whole program. And then I managed to get a job in Chicago with a futures trading firm. And that was a legit firm for real. Um, we had an office on Michigan Avenue and it was right in the beginning days of more and more people transitioning to electronic trading, which is all that anybody knows now, you know, younger, younger yeah. guys. And so it was there that I sort of had an inside look into the business so that was my first exposure. You've seen some of my videos and you probably have heard me talking about like trading size, right? Which means guys that trade two, 300 contracts at a clip or institutions that might trade a thousand contracts, um, futures contracts, or maybe a hundred thousand shares of stock, right? That was my first insight into, into that. And I saw how price could be manipulated is, is the reality of it. Um, or how size really is what pushed all movement ultimately, you know? So <clears throat> I traded there for uh, a couple of years and then I left and went out on my own. Um, and then I started an education business just because, you know, people are always interested in learning and most of what's out there is put out, not all of it. There's some good guys out there, but most of it's put out by people who have never been in the industry. Uh, so they don't really know that much about it. And um, so, yeah, I started no BS day trading quite a while back and I still have it. Yeah. I still have the site. Um, I run classes a couple times a year, you know, I haven't put out any YouTube videos in a while. I've been, you know, a little lax about that, but um, you know, I offer a range of stuff, basically a basic course that just helps get people exposed to the reality of it. <clears throat> and then you know, that pretty much lets people know if they want to continue or not, right? Some, some people will get into it and like, oh, I get this. I really want to pursue it. And other people start looking into it and they go, oh, like this is not for me, you know, which is fine. Um, and yeah. so, and, then, and I trade for myself still, you know, I still trade futures and I've been doing a lot more stock trading since they went to uh, commission-free trades. Oh, very interesting. Okay, awesome. So th thanks for that update and um, professional path the whole way getting started, transitioning into doing your own thing, which is, you know, very cool. And then even through to today, um, similar or same style as far as scalping, order flow, same everything. Very similar. Yeah, it's, it was just, it was what I learned, right? And so what I yeah. learned, um, I learned that there, like, I don't know where the market is going to be tomorrow. Right. So I, I'm much better at calling short term moves of anywhere from a few seconds to maybe half hour, you know, maybe a little longer than that. Mm -hmm. um, it just is easier to read if you're watching volume and price action. Uh, so, yeah, still pretty much the same method. I mean, some adaptations, obviously, like you, you don't trade. Like one of my we started on Treasury futures <clears throat> and I point people towards Treasury futures um, because they're more liquid and they're usually not as fast as stocks. Uh, so you kind of learn on those, but if you're trading treasury futures, you don't use the exact same method as you would trading stock index futures, you know, and if you're trading like a, a liquid ETF, it's not going to be the same exact style as you would if you were trading a faster, um, volatile stock, but this is mostly scalping still. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as the treasury futures go, do you like the 10 year? Is that the, yeah, one you I mean, on the most or? I watch the 10 year, the five year, the 30 year and the ultra bond um, because there's an interplay because there's a lot of spreading that takes place. So a lot of the treasury move, movement is due to the banks um, and institutions 
doing yield curve plays, right? Uh, so <clears throat> sometimes one will give you a clue to what the others are going to do. The 10 year is more my focus because you tend to get whipsawed less in that than you would if you were in the 30 year or the ultra bond. Um, but if you're somewhat adept at trading and you can, you know, if, if you can anticipate sort of the rushes, like the big jumps, then you'll get paid better in the 30 year or the ultra bond. Mm. Interesting. Very cool. Now, when it comes to summertime trading, are you, do you take off during the summer months or do you, are you active right now? No, I'm active. I actually, I was trading this morning and yesterday. If, if I'm at a place where I have a, like, a, I'll rent an Airbnb that has good internet, right? And then I might trade for the few days that I'm there and then uh, maybe take a couple of days off if I'm traveling. I used to, used to tell people that the summer w was not the greatest, but that's changed. Um mm because you still sometimes see some slow periods in August, I think, uh, or slow days, but the computers just get turned on every day, you know, at the major firms. So on any given day, there can be great volatility if you're, you know, it doesn't matter if it's summer or fall or not. And same thing even now around holidays. I mean, I used to not <clears throat> trade around Christmas at all or Thanksgiving mm -hmm. or whatever, but you know, Nowadays, the day after Christmas, there might be a thousand point run in the Dow. I mean, it's crazy. So yeah, I don't, yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't really go by that anymore as far as good and bad times of year. It's more just, you know, what days of the week you happen to be there, if it's volatile or not. Okay. Very interesting. And then even like your current schedule right now, are you always just on the go or do you just take like a certain time of the year where you kind of get kind of mobile the way you are right now and then you're no you're it's, it's this is mostly yeah this is summertime yeah i mean okay. so your your weather is obviously better right in june july august out in the mountains okay. um yep. so more that time and then i'll hunker down in the fall and the, the winter and well there's no winter in florida but you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. your your version of winter yeah um okay interesting now when it comes to uh scalping because i think a lot of people mistake maybe short-term trading for like really some true you know scalping um how how many round turns or how many individual should i say trades um are you typically making a day it totally depends on volatility so there were, might be some days when it's not very <clears throat> great and i may only make five or six and there might be days where i make 30 or 40 trades mm -hmm. so the idea behind it is if the action, and I know new traders don't understand this, but if the action is good, meaning you're getting like nice runs both ways, right? Like maybe, okay. maybe if the if the index, <clears throat> stock indexes are breaking lows and then they run, right? And then they turn and then when they reverse, they really reverse and they run back the other way. There can be a lot of opportunities on those days as opposed to something kind of like today um, when you have this really back and forth, nasty whipsaw activity. Uh, and it just doesn't, you just can't get paid no matter which way you go, you know, cause it'll, it'll only go like three points one way and then it comes right back three points or something. Right. So yeah, so there's not a, a set number that you should or shouldn't really trade. It's just more about mm -hmm. keep going if you're in the zone and it's, yeah. and it's good. And then if you obviously like, if you've made, eight trades and you're down money or you're break even and you're not seeing it, you may as well just chalk it up usually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think hearing that context is kind of nice because I think even hearing it's a question I get asked all the time is like, how many trades do you make a day? And I think it is it's a, kind of a weird question because there's not like a right or wrong answer, but I think right. that perspective is kind of interesting just to hear how many round turns somebody's putting on, you know, sure. Um, sure. obviously 30 being a, 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 you know, very active. Um, yeah for what most people are doing. Um, something you just said, which if you could go on a little bit, but the idea of, um, I think I, I, I've heard you say this before maybe, or maybe a blog post or something that you wrote, but maybe a general idea. You just said, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're you know, feeling it, if things are going well, keep going. Um, could you talk a little bit more just about what you mean by that? Sure. So for example, and this is a, uh... This is really any product if you happen, if you know your products, that's going to be your first um, first point of business, I guess, would be just to pretty much stay with one product 
until you have an idea of how it normally behaves, right? Mm -hmm. But what I would what I mean by that is there will be maybe a time when let's say um, the treasuries break highs, right? And then so I'm trying to maybe catch a long trade and get a piece of the run to new highs, and then yeah. they hit a, a spot that it, they just can't seem to go higher, right? So maybe I try a short trade to catch a, a kind of a reversal back lower, not a full on reversal necessarily, but just a bounce lower, right? Yep. And then they hit a bid and they can't get through that bid. And so I try a long trade. So maybe not every day, obviously, but there might be a, a, a day where now they hold that range perfectly like eight times. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that sounds weird to some people, but it's true. So maybe I go short, long, reverse, go long, cover, reverse, short comes down cover long bounce and maybe like try to catch that range seven or eight times or maybe four times or three times right whatever until it doesn't work anymore essentially right um so if you catch it once like you're free rolling right so if i, so if I catch it once i make a couple ticks i try it and it doesn't work then i'm maybe even but if it works three or four times then i make money in that range so as long as that's working i may as well keep firing mm -hmm. um versus maybe they go through highs a little bit and I take a long trade and it just stops, right? Nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Maybe it comes back on me and I lose two or three ticks or maybe I make one or two on the upside and then it just sort of hovers and maybe trades one, you know, one price for, and this sounds weird to stock traders, but like treasuries might, well, they're more volatile now, but one or two prices for like five or eight minutes and they're just not moving um same thing if you're trading like index futures or an individual stock or etf there can be these moments where obviously they're just like every time they snap highs or lows they just go right so i'm looking to i'm looking to be on board every single time they snap um until it doesn't work anymore whereas if it snaps to low like let's say the s p futures snapped to low by two points and instantly shoot back into the range right and then they hover there for 10 minutes and then they break the low again but they only break it by two points and they jump back into the range so you can't get paid on your breakout but probably if you try to go against it you'll get run over you know yeah. and so in those scenarios i try to recognize quickly that um you know it's not working um yeah. and, and only maybe make two three four trades and then just cut it versus i might be able to make 12 trades you know on a different day and get paid yeah. on all of them. And I think the um, the wisdom in that right there, it just translates across the board, however you're looking at the market to where, and I, I think this is one of the very difficult things about trading is if you're in an environment where the market is just not being very favorable to what you want to see or to how you interact with the market, um, it can be a very frustrating thing to just size down or to just stop and, and let that pass. I think the more natural thing for most everybody is in that environment, like you almost want to force it because right. you want to, you know, that that's just the natural instinct. Right. Uh, or on the flip side of that, if the market is just behaving very well and it's time for you to put your foot on the gas, be in front of the screens, be active, but you're up, it's very natural to just be like, oh, I'm up for the day. Now I can stop. Um, but that interesting dynamic to where when things are not going well, a lot of times they can get very bad if you just keep pushing it. And if things are going well, you have to push it because there's, you know, it's very likely that things are going to go very well. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it, regardless of how you're looking at the market, getting that, being able to have that feel or to understand which environment you're in um, is, is difficult and it, it's powerful. Um, to, to combat that at any level, do you just start the day maybe the same way? And then depending on how things are going, make adjustments or, or how, how would you maybe some advice for, kind of getting the feel for how your day's shaping up. Sure. So if I um, can elaborate real quick on that, on what you just Please. said, that's, it's because of biology. And I think most people inherently understand this, but they don't, um, excuse me, they don't think about it very much. When you wake up in the morning, you're, you're programmed biologically to want to be productive in some way shape or form right whether it's going for a run or whether it's trading or your job or whatever <clears throat> so to sit down at your computer to trade and then to do nothing because you can't get a read goes against your 
inherent biology, right? Mm. So trading as an endeavor or career or, or profession, um, it's, it, that's probably the reason it's the most difficult is because most people who get into it want to log on every day and make a paycheck, right? So like, I want to log on, I want to make 500 a day, I won't have to have a normal job. And that's the way that they view it. And they don't realize when they begin that that's just not the way it works. And you can ask anybody who's been doing this for any amount of time, they'll mm -hmm. tell you the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. For what you just said. So you have to combat that psychologically. And the next part of that equation that's so difficult is that to really make money, at least day trading, um, you have to trade some size, you know, and I mean, you can swing like two lots in, in the DAX and, and hope you hit, let's say, but for the most part, what you're doing is you're trying to, to capture small movements <clears throat> on more volume. So you don't trade a one lot for 10 ticks, you trade a 10 lot for one tick. See? And it, it can be much easier to do that because uh, you don't have to capture such big runs to make money. So your normal person gets into this and they're trading a one lot and they're trying to be patient and they're being disciplined. But then when they finally catch their trade, they only make $40, right? And what happens is, is they end up losing discipline and they, they start trading over trading or they trade too much size for their bank account. So it is something that you have to fight um, psychologically. And then, yeah, what happens is the more you do this, you sit down on your, your screen every day. I sit down, I just turn it on and right away within 10 minutes, um, I know whether or not, not for the whole morning, let's say, I usually only trade mornings, but I know probably within the next 30 minutes, whether it's going to be good or not good. Mm. So it's, it's just, you turn it on some days and instantly it's just not hard. It's just like, okay, they're going up, you buy it, they're going down, you sell it. And it works because there's follow through on the moves. Yeah. And then you turn on the next day and you, you know, you kind of hold back and then it goes up a little, but then it goes right down and it goes up a little and down. And every time you think you might have a read, it goes the opposite direction. <laughs> right. So at that point, if you, you know, if you realize that you're like, all right, well, I wanted to go long and it went lower. I wanted to go short, it went higher. Then I wanted to go long and it went lower maybe I shouldn't be trading, you know, probably. Um, but then you're faced with, if it's 10 o'clock in the morning and all your friends have normal jobs, what do you do with your day, right? That's, so that's another part of it. It's like guys, guys fall into, or gals, um, fall into that pattern of, well, I logged on, maybe, and maybe they log on at 9.30 or 8.30 and they're up $400 or 500 or whatever. And now they're like, well, I'm good. I have some money. The action's dead, but what am I going to do for the next six hours? Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah. and this, that's a dilemma that also faces um, at home traders these days. So at least if offices aren't really around much anymore, but back in the day, like if you're in an office, at least you'd have guys to, you know, talk to or go to lunch with or whatever. So it can be difficult. For sure. Yeah. Really nice. And, and it may be one of the things that to emphasize what you just said, there was a lot you just said there, but that idea of the way to really make money in this business, trading more size and capturing smaller moves, as opposed to, I, again, I think a natural thing is to be nervous or, and for good reason, because of undercapitalization. So using small size and then trying to let that go for 20, 30 points on the S&P right. or something, right. um, which is a very tough thing, I think, to do consistently. But um, you know, and, and that's even something I'm currently, you know, dealing with right now as well. But well, uh, let me I, tell I you, it. let me tell you why it's tough to do um, sure. consistently. Okay. What most people don't realize is when, if there's not a huge fundamental factor at play, like a big news yeah. report or something on a daily basis, the market makers, market makers being, I won't name them, but the bigger firms that you've heard of, right. <clears throat> They're, they're throughout the day, they work the, both sides. So they work the bids and the asks, and they're not trying to push the S&P 20 points. They're, what they're doing is they're waiting to just kind of get hit on one side. So if the market's slow, you might have a market making firm 
let's say this work, uh, market maker in, in one stock, let's say, and he's working both sides. He's got bids working and he's got offers working. And so if buyers hit into his offer, he just cancels his bids, which causes price to go lower. And if sellers hit into his bid, he cancels his offers and then buy it, bids it up. And all that guy is trying to do is scalp pennies all day long back and forth. So if the bigger firms don't have to push or, you know, maybe a big fund that's managing a couple billion, like if, if they're not having to liquidate or having to hedge on a big position, then you don't get a, a domino effect in one direction, right? So your average retail trader wants that 15 point run on the S&P, but he doesn't realize it's only gonna run 15 points if the institutions are, all, are full steam ahead also on that same direction. But probably when it's slow or, or at least two to three days a week, they're just gonna play both sides. So they're gonna, they're gonna try to you know, get hit filled, the S&P will run five, six points and they're gonna cover. And then they're gonna reverse and go the other way. And that's why you see the back and forth shot. Today is an excellent example of that. Now mm -hmm. it's, it's higher because of uh, the numbers at 8.30. Um, you had retail sales and then you had uh, Michigan sentiment at 10 a.m. <clears throat> so your overall trend was higher, but with the exception of like a couple points of the day, it was mostly just back and forth. And it's back and forth because those guys are just trying to scalp, scalp. That's what they're doing. Well, all those guys, the algorithms and the AI and the programs that are working for them. Yeah. So maybe that was too long of a talk, but I wanted you like, that's what people don't, they really don't understand that. So right. that's why if you can become better at projecting, again, whatever product you're trading, if you can project the next um, few takes or, or, you know, five cent run or 10 cent run in the stock or whatever, and you can do that on volume, it's easier to gain consistency because there's going to be more opportunities throughout the day for you to do that than there will be for you to catch a 20 point run in the S and P. Right. And from time to time, will you ever have trades that end up going like the 15, the nine, 10, 15 points, just because you're, you know, occasionally. Yeah. Occasionally, but that's not really what I, my style. And, and the reason is because it, it just doesn't happen that often. So yeah, okay. I'm more looking just to capture uh, momentum. And then when the mo when momentum slows down, I get out. And then if I think it's going to pick up momentum again, I'll get back in as opposed to holding with like a, a wide trailing stop. I would just prefer to take, take the trade off because so many times it does end up reversing on you, you know? So if, yeah. if I use a break even trailing stop, I end up breaking even instead of actually making a profit on that trade. So yeah. The, the 15 point runs don't accommodate for what I would give back on all those other trades, basically. Right on. Okay. So if you're in a trade, it's going from here all the way up to here, you'll go from here to here. And instead of waiting to see if it's going to continue and letting it roll back on you, you'll get all the way out. Just essentially, you just put it right back on. Yep. Yeah. I'll, I'll hit out. And then if it looks like they're going to hit it run again, you know, and obviously this will, it adds up commissions um, on the future side, which is one of the reasons why stocks become such a great trade because um, there's not, you still have to pay uh, SEC fees, but the, the cost of making 30 trades has been drastically reduced because of commission-free trading. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I prefer just to, I usually just hit all out, take my money. And then if I think it's going to run again, just buy it again. And sometimes yeah. I miss out, you know, but again, like the times I miss out, you, would not normally accommodate for what I would end up giving back on the times it turns and comes back to my entry. Yep. Okay. Do you have, uh, on the future side of things, do you license a seat? Not anymore. I used to. Okay. Yeah, I used to. Um, and, and then kind of got out of it and definitely got out of it when the, when the stock thing became normal. You can get pretty low fees still these days. I mean, you can get um, under two bucks a round for treasuries these days even without a, without a seat. But mm -hmm. yeah, if you're someone who's, who's doing thousand turns a month, I'd say, you know, maybe, maybe even a little less than that, but if you're consistently doing a thousand turns a month, it's well worth becoming a member of uh, the CME or CBOT and then leasing a seat. 
Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. Now, um, if, if you don't mind just a little bit, maybe about your specific, when you're entering into a trade, are you going all in kind of scaling out for profit, all in, all out for loss? I'm all in, all out both ways, usually. Oh, okay. Always yeah. all in, all out. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's a reasoning for that. Um, I, I have it in one of my videos. Uh, the, the summary of it is that what usually happens when people try to scale. So I'm not like, this isn't meant to become a debate about whether scaling works or not. Obviously scaling works for some people. Sure. <clears throat> but what typically happens is that people end up inversing their risk to reward. So if they, like they go all in on, um, let's say a six lot, right? With the idea of scaling out two, two and two on the way up. But they're going to take a, uh, you know, a loss on the six lot if it goes against them. What happens is they get all in on a six lot. <clears throat> you can't see my hands. I'm sorry. I'm making motions here. <laughs> and you can't see them. Uh, they get all in on a six lot and the market goes in their favor and then they take profit on a two lot but then the market comes back on their entry and they either break even or they end up taking a loss on a four lot right <clears throat> whereas if they had just taken the whole six lot off they would have made a, a complete profit on the six mm -hmm. so new people constantly fall into that problem of they're trying to scale out of the profit side but they're constantly giving back a lot of their money because the market doesn't run the 10 points or the 15 points uh so they end up risking you know on full size and, and they can also be wrong right so they get in a trade on a six and it instantly goes against them and they lose on six but if it moves for them and they take two off then it comes back they've only made on two see what i mean yeah so you know, again, if you there's some amount of size that you would have to scale if you hit a certain level, but I typically tell people start all in, all out, just because that'll that'll help you know when you're building real consistency in terms of anticipating direction. You mm -hmm. know, you don't. It's not even that you have to have a high win rate necessarily, but you have to have it. If you have all in, all out, and you're net profitable consistently week after week, month after month, at that point, then maybe you start playing with scaling in um, to some size and, and pushing on moves. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, nor normally people, when they try to scale, they get just annihilated. I mean, I have so many emails from guys that, you know, they they go live <clears throat> and um, got like guys that work at prop shops sometimes <clears throat> and they're like trading on simulators or whatever. And then they go live and they realize it's a whole different ball game. Um, and then they have that one day where they just keep averaging in, you know, like they buy it and it goes and they double and they goes and they quadruple. And then they just, you know, they give away a month's worth of profits in one day type sure, of thing. Sure. Mm. Hey. Where are you located, by the way? Um, I'm where? in Connecticut. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Man. Up here in the Northeast where we have uh, real winters. Yes, we do. <laughs> sure. We do. Um, Okay, awesome. Thank you for that. Now, when you do or when you focus on like your risk reward, are you are you happy with like one to one risk reward that you're going for? What's kind of like your idea or your thought yeah, process yeah. around it? It's so that's also based on um, the particular trade. Uh, obviously, uh, yeah, ideally, you don't want to be risking three to make one. Um, but it has more to do again with adapting to the, the price action at play. So uh, if, you know, if I'm, if I'm taking a trade for like, let's say I think they're going to run to new highs and they do, then I just try to give it room to run, you know, and, and maybe I'm going to get, based on my initial risk assessment, maybe I'm going to get three to one, four to one, five to one on that kind of a, a risk to reward, a reward to, to risk. Whereas <clears throat> if it's more of a, like a range play, um, then it's going to be like one-to-one, -one, right? Like maybe I'm going to, I, I should have kind of the right area. And if I don't, you know, you, you take a, th a three, three point loss or three tick loss or whatever, and I'm only going for three ticks because that's what the range is, you know, or like maybe the range is, is four, four or five, but I'm maybe only going to go for three of that. And then I'm going to risk three if I'm wrong, if it goes through me. 
you know so again it just depends on the particular setup and the, the price action awesome do you when you enter the market hotkeys uh, I uh, click, I have a hot keys for like canceling, uh, okay. stops and orders, but I usually use a mouse and just click in and click out on the ladder on the ladder. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay. Um, now when it comes to maybe the, let's say just switching gears a little bit, the YouTube side of things, um, wh why have you stopped making videos? Uh, I haven't, well, yeah, I guess I haven't made any in a while. Um, <laughs> yeah. I made one last year about the reason day traders self-destruct where I just okay. talked, where I explained what I did. I think it's more, honestly, it's just personality. It's, um, I, I put a bunch of them out there originally just to garner interest. You know, hopefully people learn something. They go to my site if they want to learn more. I run classes a few times a year. I trade, from, but I still trade for myself on a regular basis too, you know. So, uh, you know, you're not the first person who's asked that. So I, obviously it's time for me to make another YouTube video on something. It's also more about topics. Like I don't want to repeat myself, you mm -hmm. know? So like I already have a video on the order flow basics. I already have a video on the reason day trade or self-destruct. I already have a video on this or that. So I'm, I'm trying to find new ways to say the same thing. And that yeah. can be difficult. That can be difficult sometimes. Oh, for sure. For sure. For sure. Um, it just as a side note, no BS day trading. If anybody goes there, you have uh, kind of just like an order flow basic video that might yes. be one of your most popular. And it was yeah. the, the, the first thing I've seen from you. Um, maybe your chat with traders podcast episode first, but mm -hmm. I don't think so. Um, either way, it's got to be as far as like what's available for free online. Uh, you know, one of the best, just comprehensive, well explained of a, of a topic that can be very difficult for people um at least initially uh it's i'd recommend everybody go watch it because it's it's there and it's still you know available um thank you for that yeah no it's yes yeah. you know it's fantastic and it's it's tough because i know well actually a few things going back to what you just said earlier about like trying to say the same things but differently is um i, I really believe that one of the one of the things that great traders know and i would love to just hear if you have a thought on this or if you would agree is that there's not there's almost like these basic things that you need to know about this business and there's not that many of them and mastering those things is kind of like the secret and what trips a lot of people up when they're struggling is they've never mastered these basics and they're constantly looking for something else they're constantly looking for something new something that hasn't been said yet um, and kind of an unattractive secret is there's just a handful of things you got to know. And the secret is just knowing those things really, really well, not, uh, not getting caught up in just always looking for something new. Any thoughts on that? For, for sure. I couldn't, I could not agree more, man. I mean, my, yeah. the, the joke in our office was when, when somebody asks you, how do you trade? You just say buy low, so high. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, that, that explains it. And it's, it is more than that, but that is the trick. And so, Again, I think it comes down to, you know, to try to relate to, to the viewers, the average person, like it, a lot of it depends on your, your place in life, right? So if you're, if you're a young person who's 18, 19, 22, you have no obligation, maybe you're still living at home, you know, you don't have any overhead, you can be a gunslinger and you can spend a lot of time watching the screen, uh, and just trying to figure out how you how to play the game the same way that you would figure out how to play a video game, right? Mm -hmm. But for other people, you know, somebody maybe who's in the thirties is married, has kids, has a mortgage, has two car payments, has health insurance. This person needs money tomorrow, right? And I think that's what that certainly is what you know when I was younger would prevented me from doing it like the only reason i learned is because i got that job and they paid me a salary so i was being paid a salary to stare at the market all day you know most people don't have that right um so that the reason they jump from one to the other isn't because they're not capable of, of figuring out those basics it's because they need the money you know yeah so yeah if there's one thing that people need to understand it is it's not that complicated it's an auction it's most it's just about identifying strength and weakness on one side and then it's about anticipating which is a big part of it like you 
the other part that people fall into, particularly with what I would say outdated versions of technical analysis, is they're they're always waiting for the break to happen before they get in the trade, and that's the wrong way to do it. You need to anticipate anticipate the break before the break happens, because when the break happens, that's how you get paid. So these you know people watching a moving average or a trend line like they wait for the trend line to break before they sell it or buy it well don't do that i mean not giving advice but like what i'm looking for i don't watch trend lines but let's say i was is when it's coming up to the trend line i'm trying to get a read on the price action do i think it's going to go through the trend line or not and if i think it's going to go through the trend line then i'm going to buy before it hits the trend line because if it does hit the trend line and that does set off stop orders that's how I get paid. If I end up chasing after they've already ran, then I'm the guy buying from the people that are selling to me that caught that move. See what I mean? Yeah. So little things like that is they it trips people up as well. They because mm. they're they're delayed reactions or they're waiting too long or they're hesitating too long or something. Do you and when you have that uh, when you are anticipating? Um, this is something that you read the order flow to get like your method for understanding when to hit the push or not. It's all just based on your order flow. Yeah, it's based on the, the first key bringing it back would be you need to, or a person needs to focus on only one product or one or two products to learn the normal behavior of those products. And when yeah. I say normal behavior, Again, like I said, like if the treasuries are dominated by banks, so it's like a poker game. So you're trying to figure out how do the banks play that poker game on a regular basis. Whereas if you're trading maybe a certain group, of, like if you're trading tech stocks, you know, then what are the market makers usually doing in those tech stocks? Like how do they normally behave? Um, and then you just start to watch the price action to get a feel for Again, when there's just, there appears to be very good liquidity and guys are pushing or the liquidity is maybe light and it's, you know, sucks, you know, and you just, you can tell like, you just, you even start to know, you just know if you hit the, like if you buy, it's going to go lower. You know, you like, you have those days where you're like, I just know I'm going to get trapped if I go one way or the other. That takes some experience, but that's what it's based on. Yeah trying to trust so when i when i have that sensation or i'm seeing really nasty back and forth like this morning i'm trying to avoid getting involved and if i if i'm noticing that there's good follow through and good liquidity then i'm clicking the mouse yeah really i would say like a super key topic right here uh the idea of you anticipating that this is breaking is not something that comes from uh it's 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 very different than somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, having a very loose idea that, it, oh, the market looks like it's going up, so I want to jump on board with it. And I think that kind of gut reaction that comes from inexperience is very common in trading where a lot of people just chase around price because it looks like it's doing this or it looks like it's doing this and they get caught up in the noise. And it's very, I think on the surface, a thin line, but there's so much that separates um, a, a truly earned and deserved level of skill to where it almost seems probably like you're just trading off of your reaction or off your emotion or what you think. But what's going on to the surface is years and years of mastery to where you're doing something at an unconscious level. And maybe in that moment, it looks like it's just maybe magic or, or just guessing, but it, there's something that you, I think is even very hard to describe. Um, but it's something that's earned and it's a level of mastery that you get over time. There's really no way to, to just learn that without going through the trenches. Um, and so I, I think a really important topic. I agree. And so the analogy that I use is just comparing it to professional sports. Um, you know, a guy looks like he just sh shoots three pointers all day because he's super talented, but he wasn't born that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so trading is, bas is, is basically a, a mental mental athletics in the same way like playing poker would be mental athletics. So if you, some people may, may not play poker, but there are times when you've, if you played with like the same guys for a couple hours, you just know what the guy has. 
Like you literally, you know exactly what the guy is holding in his hand. Now you don't know that every hand, right? But when you know it, then you know how to respond to that. And that's the product of, of hundreds of hours sitting at a poker table. So same thing with the trading, right? Like you, you have to sit there and it's not, it's not guesswork and it's not luck where the luck comes in is usually in the amount of, of money made. So the luck isn't in anticipating a breakout. The luck is on that particular day it, is the breakout five points or is the breakout 15 points. Yeah. Right. And if it run, if it only, if it only runs four or five points and that's all it gives you, that's all it gives you, you know, you made the right call, but you can't get anything, you know, you can't squeeze it if it won't give it to you. Um, and then the next day that you hit it, it just flies 15 points and you get paid. Right. So that's where more of the luck factor comes in. Not so much in the, in the consistency or in the calls, but in the bottom line based on that. Okay. Doing what you do and in trading in general, it, it requires a lot of mental flexibility. Mm-hmm. And um, do you have any words for dealing with that aspect of it where, again, maybe you're in a trade and it's giving you those five points, it's not giving you the 15, but you're trading, maybe a, a somebody who's not trading exactly like you, they have a target that they think is very likely to go to and they get married to the idea it's going up 15 points and they can't bring themselves to just lock in the five that they have um, or any version of that to where maybe a trade is clearly not working anymore, but they've become a little married to that idea. You do it at such a short level where your ability to flip the script must be <laughs> very uh, in tune. Um, but w- any, any uh, advice for dealing with like mental flexibility and not getting attached to the outcome or attached to your idea of playing out the way you wanted to exactly? Absolutely. The, the first question that you would ask, let's just take a, a hypothetical trader. Hypothetical trader has a target of 15 points. Why does he think he knows the market's going to run 15 points? That's what catches so many people. They're like, well, I'm looking at this and I think it's going to run 15 points. So why do you think that? What do you know that I don't know? That's what I want to know. So when you're looking at it from that perspective, which they don't know, that's the point. If the market's moving very easily in one direction it's again it's only because there is a lot of money going in that direction so that can be some big funds or even only one big firm uh moving a lot of size or it can be the the result of thousands of day traders all going the same way at the same time right but as it's happening there's no way to know where volume is going to step up so the, the person thinks I'm shooting for 15 points and then the market runs five points and it just hits a wall, right? Mm-hmm. So like, let's say it's going higher. And so you trace, you know this, uh, do you watch the volume profile? Like you watch the, the amounts? Okay, sure. so you watch, okay. So just watching volume profile, I, you know, um, y- you can see, you can see in stocks too, right? Like it's, it's moving, let's just say, and they're trading 10,000 shares trades, 20,000 shares trade, uh, you know, 15,000 shares trade. And it just keeps going, blank, 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 blank. And then suddenly it hits a price and 250,000 shares trade. And, and, and magically price stops going up. Mm-hmm. Well, price stops going up because somebody just unloaded a quarter million shares, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm so flexible. Like I'm just waiting to see that. Or I mean, they can still go through there. But the point is, if you're trying to do this risk to reward, not you, but somebody, you know, three to one or two to one, and my target's 10 points, or my target's 12 points, you're completely dismissing the information being given to you in the volume profile, which is showing you, all right, yeah, it is moving through these prices really easily. There's no one there. The offers aren't there suddenly somebody is is willing to sell a quarter million shares well well, who's willing to sell a quarter million shares and why and now how will that probably affect this this movement Mm -hmm. and so if it happens to be a time when i think it'll turn based on that then i'll flip and go short and if i if i'm not really sure if it's a little choppy i'll just get out sit on the sidelines but i'm 
I'm responding, which is what scalpers and really what all traders should be doing. You're responding yeah. to what you see rather than thinking you know something yeah. that you don't know, right? Like, yeah. I mean, in a great example of this, especially this last year or this year, look at these fund managers that are just getting annihilated. Yeah. You know, like Ackerman bought Netflix at 600 or whatever. He dumped for half a billion dollar loss or whatever it was. Um, you know, ARC is getting crushed, averaging in the tech stocks and, and, and crypto. And these are people that have billions of dollars at their, their disposal in a network of information that their average guy can't even begin to, to know. And, um, you know, so kind of, that's sort of the point like you there are i'm not saying there there are times when you can get a pretty good feel like all right the markets are probably going to sell off five six percent or whatever but over the maybe the course of a couple of days but from an intraday standpoint stop me if i'm rambling i just it's extraordinarily difficult to be able um to predict the next 20 point run in the s p yeah. i mean it, it really is it's it's much more difficult than people think it is yeah. Whereas it, predicting the next, you know, four or five, six points is, is not always that hard. Hmm. Yeah, really nice to hear you say it. And I, for me, one of the things that will trip me up the most is when I get an idea in my mind for good reasons, it starts working out. And it's, it's maybe it's like a simple example. I know that the initial balance for the day is likely to break. Uh, a lot of things are pointing that we are, we've Fail to continue higher. I have good reasons for expecting this to keep moving lower. It gets really close to the initial balance and it just doesn't break it. And I'll let the entire thing just roll back on me. A lot of times take a loss or, or you know, if there's something that I can deem as, as very likely to happen next. And especially if it starts giving me a lot of signs of it, there's like periods in my life where I, I really slip into just getting married to being right. And it's one of the a very difficult thing that I'm constantly having to identify and start to correct the ship. And even as we're talking, I'm actually dealing with like this, my biggest struggle right now is just uh, the markets are being so messy and I'm not getting follow through on what I'm you know, thinking is going to happen next. And so it's, it's 100% something that I'm, uh, I'm constantly on guard of. And to, to the point you're just saying, it's just, I think a good dose of humility of just the idea that we do not know what's going to happen next and never forgetting that or convincing ourselves that we do. Um, and then also trading with our eyes and, and not our hearts. Uh, some of these things, very basic things, but mastering those basics to where they just happen naturally, uh, right. I think right. is the path to be on, you know? Um, but anyway, it, it's also just nice to hear you say some of these things that, uh, that, that are somewhat basic, but they're, you know, I mean, e ego will kill you. And yeah. actually ego, ego, like there's a certain amount of ego that I don't know if it's, it's actually ego, but there's a certain amount of self-confidence that people need to have to, to undertake any endeavor, right? It doesn't have to be trading, like anything you want to do. You're like, you know what? I'm going to learn how to do that. And, you know, you need that part of it. Yeah. But what happens is, and I think that is, this is what has happened to these fund managers um, this year. They start to, the ego starts to get so big that, they don't acknowledge what they're seeing with their own eyes, you know? And I, so that brings back to what you were saying. So it, if you're, if you're struggling with that, I mean, one of the things that you could do, what do you primarily trade? Do you trade across the board or do you trade stocks or futures or? All yeah, kinds of I'll trade futures exclusively. Um, I'll focus on the S and P 500 is my bread and butter. And then okay. like with the volatility we've been seeing, it's like my sole focus. Okay. Um, but you know, if it was like a typical summer, I'd be looking at also crude oil, gold, and probably the Russell. Okay, so so let's let's go with the ES since because I watch the ES and the Nasdaq and um, the futures uh, definitely when I'm trading the ETS or stocks. Yeah. But like with the with the ES, <clears throat> if you if you start to watch the price action and, and kind of pay attention, there's a lot of shakeout periods which is what what you see we're seeing right now so again this is because the market makers are on both sides so <clears throat> you take a trade and maybe initially it moves in your favor but they just won't pay you right like you're sitting there and you're like why won't why can i not get paid on this thing 
right? Well, it, that's not like some mysterious thing. This is calculated on their part. So what happens sometimes is they'll buy up uh, the ES and, and they're doing it across the board with, with uh, the weighted stocks and they're hedging maybe with options, but you see it go up a little bit, right? And then they just won't pay you and you're long. And then it drops back in, drops back in, drops back in. And then often what happens is people sell out and it's the shakeout. And then after you get out, then they run the highs, right? Sure. Now, <clears throat> that's really calculated. And there are times when they can do that and times when they can't do that. So again, bringing it back to just living in the moment. Um, if everybody's going one way and there are a bunch of stop orders and, and shorts are getting squeezed, then it'll just go and you'll get paid and it won't be a problem. You made the right read, it's gonna go. But if you're noticing that that's happening to you two or three times, like your first two or three, four trades of the day, chances are those conditions aren't going to improve very much. And so what you want to do is recognize that you made the call, but you just can't get paid. And so you get out. So don't let it come back and turn into a loss, especially on a big loss, right? It's like, take the trade off, feel it out, try again. If it happens, if you make three or four trades and you can't get paid on any of them, it's, I mean, it depends on, on your, your skill set, but if you know something about the markets, and you've made three, four, five trades, and you just cannot seem to get paid. Probably that's because of conditions. It's not because yeah. you're being stubborn or you're making like bad calls. It's usually just conditions. Um, it, it's they're just not pushing it. There's no one pushing it. There's no puke outs. No one's getting squeezed, right? So these guys they'll just average in. I mean, if if uh, Treasuries, for example even if you have a firm, they're working like a lot of size, uh, maybe they have a couple hundred contracts on and it goes three, four ticks against them. Well, if they don't face any real danger of being run over on that day, they'll just average in, they'll buy more, they'll pump it back up and they'll try to, to you know, scale out for a break even on that position. And if that's happening, it's extraordinarily difficult to get paid on anything because every time you, you know, every time you hit in, it just sits there. So that's what yeah, I would yeah. say. Like, yeah, if you're if you're in a, if you're in a trade and it's it's not going to go for you, just take it, take the money. Yeah, yeah I tell you, and it, it's there's something about just talking it out and hearing you know somebody who I would respect say it back to me. But one of the most frustrating days for me is when we're in an environment where uh, you're exactly described it. You're just not getting paid on these ideas, and I'll find myself giving away a few thousand dollars just unrealized gains that was up that just all rolled back on me kind of all morning long. And uh, it, it might even be like one of the biggest things I need to grow in right now is just mental flexibility of a quick, being much more quick to adapt to these things. Um, you know, not trying to squeeze a free coaching session out of you, but- uh, it's No, that's all right, man. It's all good, dude. I got nothing. I think I'm gonna get rained out today anyway, so it's fine. Oh, for shame. Yeah, okay. it sucks. Uh, talk to me about this. When you're trading, are you just using ladders? Do you use charts at all? Do you have a different charting tool you're using? I watch the ladder and the volume profile or uh, like time and sales and the stocks. Um, yeah. And that's it. So it, it really is based on on uh, what you said earlier. Like you, you, if you stare at, you, are you familiar with, um, he's not around anymore, but Paul Rotter, the guy that was called the flipper. You ever no. read up on him? So, so look, so let me give you some, some read, reading tips. Please. The flipper, uh, he was known as, his name was Paul Rotter, R-O-T-T-E-R. And I think I, I have some links still to his interviews on my website under my links page. Like for, I have free information page and it has like links to stuff. Yep. But Paul Rotter, Tom Baldwin, these are older guys, but you'll understand when you read it. Um, Tom Baldwin? Tom Baldwin, Harris Brumfield, B-R-U-M-F-I-E-L-D. He started trading technologies. Uh, and really, if you anything, even like the flash, flash traders or whatever it was called, I can't remember the, the guy that wrote that book. Um, he was, it was a few years ago, but he's talking about like high speed, high frequency trading. Yeah. Um, what you'll find if you like you read 
read these guys' interviews is all of them were just watching volume and the price book. So Paul Rotter was infamous because he was the biggest trader in the Bun Bobble Shats uh, in the world at one time, like individual. He it was unbelievable how much size this guy moved. And he was manipulating price, that's what he was doing. Um, but somebody asked him, like, how do you learn how to trade? And his answer was, you spend a long time looking at the order book. And there, and I know to the average person, like, it's not like I'm following every single print in the NASDAQ futures, right? Like, obviously, the eye can't. But what I am following is the general behavior of it. And if, if you begin just, I tell people, like, if you turn off your chart, just do it like as a personal uh, sorry, personal um, goal. If you're, because if you're not already making a lot of money trading, right, then chances are there's some things you don't know. So if you're not, if you don't have something that's already working really well and you're looking for new information, then try something new. So the test that I put before my customers is turn off your charts for a month. And don't look at them at all. I mean, don't bring them up in the morning. Don't see what happened overnight. Don't look at them at all. And just bring up the order book. And it's, I mean, you, you'll even see it. I mean, oil and gold are pretty fast, but even in oil and gold, um, because I have a couple of, of customers who trade oil. Just look at the order book and the volume profile and watch the volume that's trading and watch the price action. And you will be, really amazed at how quickly you start to pick up on things and so a lot of people you know um, and you don't have to do it obviously it's up to you but a lot of people kind of give up on it after about a week but the people that stick with it for 30 days they they're like oh yeah now i'm starting to understand what you're talking about Mm -hmm. um again for day trading right we're talking about just short short short-term day trading yeah okay very interesting and the, the order flow and um when you say volume profile, no candles, just the actual profile. Yeah, just developing. the actual volume. I mean, some people have like the histograms, right? But yeah, eh, that, I like the I, I like seeing the numbers. So I want to know if if uh, you know three hundred thousand contracts have traded or or one hundred fifty thousand, because sometimes that makes a difference. You know, it, it'll look sure. the same on the histogram, but um, or similar on the histogram. But if you see the actual numbers, it might give you a better idea of of the real price. Yeah, very good. Um, when you are preparing for your trading day, you're not doing any type of like top down approach when, when you're ready for the actual like aspects of trading. I'm sure there's things you do to prepare, but um, let's say from like the technical analysis standpoint, you are firing up and just looking to get into the rhythm of things or there's, there's no, uh, there's no like top down analysis that you do beforehand to come up with trade ideas, right? There's none. I mean, honestly, so um, if you look, if you do some reading on, uh, you can, you can always edit this, right? You can edit, edit the video or whatever, like however you want it. Right. Yeah. So are you familiar with Andrew Huberman? Um, He's a neuroscientist at a. Yeah. Huberman. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Of course. The podcast, right. It's awesome. Right. Right. Podcast. So the reason I mentioned this is because well, one of his things that he says, which is I've been doing for years, but he's right, is like when you wake up in the morning, just go get some sunlight on your eyes and mm-hmm. walk, right? Even if you're just walking around your house because it's frigid cold outside, walk around your house a little bit, you know, look out the window and just do what you're supposed to do when you normally wake up, you know, as a human being. Um, and that alone is is much better than just instantly flipping open your screen and start digging into the charts or the overnight or whatever, right? Just kind of get your body moving. Um, yeah. Eat, don't eat, coffee, co- no coffee, whatever. Um, and then for me, honestly, I just flip open the screen, turn it on and, and go at that point. Um, yeah. I will be aware of what happened overnight, right? So like, it, obviously, if, when I turn, if I turn on the screen and I see that the Dow futures are off 600, then I'll be, you know, aware of, okay, we're going to open a lot lower um, and then take it from there. But ultimately it's more about really just trying to get a feel for 
again, like good liquidity, you know, like is, is size trading, is it, are they pushing one direction easily or, or even if they're going back and forth, are they doing it in a way that's readable versus, yeah. you know, that versus maybe like the, the, the um, liquidity in the ES, instead of being a hundred by a hundred, it's 10 by 10. Right? right. So if you got 10, 10 by 10, they just spike it both ways, three points on, on no volume. Well, how do you predict that? I don't, you know, I don't know where the, where the next, you know, 200 contracts are going to go, but if the liquidity is good and it's a hundred up on both sides and I can kind of see they keep pushing through, you know, price after price, then at least I know that it's tradable. Yeah. 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 And I think you correct me if I'm wrong, even that what you're saying here of, uh, you know, being able to look at that and understand practically what you just said, like, how do you actually look at this, the, the screens and be able to know this. And it comes from staring at the same thing and understanding what is normal. And, and, and the, the only way to understand that something is different or that something is good is you have to just be incredibly familiar with what is baseline, when something is relatively being high, as far as like maybe liquidity or relatively low. And these things, there's no secret thing that tells you this. But you know this from doing like what you just said, spending a month just looking at it and you, you're able to then know these things. Uh, yes, yes. Right. It, it takes time. And, and, and when you see it, it's not hard to see. So uh, if, you know, for example, like if the, if the ES earlier in the year or whatever, right? If the ES, you turn it on every day and you're seeing at least 50, 60, 70 contracts on every price, but on the bid ask, right? And it's trading that or more, you know, 100, 150, 200 at almost every price. And then one day you flip on your screen and it's five by five up because, you know, whatever Russia invaded Ukraine, right? You know, that's obviously going to play a, a big role in the volatility of that product, um, which is also something a lot of new traders don't understand. Like if they're just watching charts, they don't understand the reason the market moved so far is because it was trading five contracts at each price instead of a hundred at each price. Right. Yeah. So just gaining that one insight alone completely is like an aha moment for a lot of new traders. Yeah, that's fine. Um, you might've, already answered it as we're talking, I suspect you might have, but let's say um, if you had to say one activity that would help you the most in your trading, but it's off the screens, what would you say it is? Um, challenging yourself with anything else that's difficult, you know, like mm -hmm. I'm um, not that anyone cares, but like I, I downhill mountain bike out here. So that's okay. so, uh, that's why I'm here. Like I, I ride the bike parks. So it's awesome. Like, so some people like to ride cross country. I'm not so big on pedaling. I like to go downhill fast. Um, it, but you know, it's something that if I crash, I'm going to hurt myself, but, it, but it makes, but it challenges me. Right. Uh, so if, if, if it's in mostly physical, so if it's either biking, hiking, swimming, lifting weights, whatever, like just kind of pushing yourself, to a point where you didn't think that you could go. Um, yeah. it, you know, most people, they, people know this inherently, like it feels good. You know, it, it, you, it might seem kind of silly, but cause like, why am I running? But you're running just to prove to yourself that you can run a mile, right? Mm. Just to prove that you can do it. And then when you do it, you feel good about it. Uh, but not only do you feel good, your body is just in better shape because of it, right? So yeah. I, I would say any physical endeavor, um, because trading is mental enough. I mean, learning to play games is fine too, but usually you're better off doing some something physical. Mm. I mean, I'm not the most physical guy, but like I get outside, I walk a lot, I ride bikes, I do all this stuff and I always feel yeah. better. Yeah. And it also teaches you that you can do something you didn't think you could do. Yeah. I, I think that's such a, I'm really, really happy you said that. And I, I think that uh, something I adhere to is the idea that in most cases, we don't really have, uh, you know, whatever's going wrong in the screens. A lot of times it's just like something is wrong with us. And like, we got something off with us. That's just showing up in our trading Absolutely. and you fix that thing off the screens uh, you fix it here. But just even the idea that how integrated our lives and our performance is and trading will, 
uh, push you to your limits and it, it will cause you to be in very uncomfortable situations. Um, the comfortable thing to do, the natural thing to do, like we've already talked about, is usually the wrong thing to do. And being outside the screens, doing something that pushes you to be uncomfortable uh, and, and, and pushes you further than, like you said, maybe you thought you wanted to go, that type of lifestyle or that type of activity will reflect in your trading as opposed to just comfortable all day waking up just doing what's comfortable and then sitting on the screens and think you're going to be able to you know perform well um you know it's just not how it's going to work so right and i i tell people that too like i even wrote it in in the book i have is <clears throat> like if you if you have um you wrote a book uh not well yes yeah, it's, it's part of my my basic course it's not anything okay. that was published but um it comes with a bunch Sorry, of videos. Yeah. Anyway, no worries. Um, it's just a little ebook that I wrote a long time ago, and then I've I've updated videos to go with it. But um, if you wake up and you're sick, don't trade. If you wake up and you and you're and there's something wrong, like if you're in a relationship and and it's weighing on you, don't trade. If your yeah, pet died, don't trade. If a relative died, don't. Like all of these things, what you just said. If there's something internally and and you're off, if you're angry at the world for some reason, you know you should never even turn on the platform because the instant you turn on that screen, you're going to want to trade. So if you're off, yeah, you should, you shouldn't trade. Um, and also you, you have to go into it as a business. So this is the other part that people don't really do. And I tell people this, if you are going to sink, let's just say $50,000 into a, a, a a restaurant franchise let's say a cheap i don't try can't even do that anymore but back in the day you know you buy a, a sandwich shop franchise or whatever you're gonna go about that very seriously right like you're gonna scout your location you're gonna count the foot traffic that comes by that place you're gonna know your cost you're gonna know your employees like you're gonna you're gonna put a lot of effort into it but the the same people that would do that would also put 50k in an account and just swing for the fences they yeah. don't treat they don't treat trading like a business you have to treat trading like a business it has to be viewed as i am in this to make money full stop that's it that's the only thing that matters i don't care about ego and the day-to-day -day results are only relative in the sense of of a year-end result um, so you have to view it from a month in year end standpoint. And that's what can, like when you turn on your screen one day, if you want to make 500 bucks that day, then you're going to lose money. But mm -hmm. if you turn it on and you're like, well, my goal, you know, I'm trying to average out whatever, 10,000 a month, let's say, and I'm already up 4,000 on the month and today is not a good day. All right, fine. Turn off, you know, turn off the screen. That's where that has to come into play. Like it has to be, I'm in this for money. I'm not in this to keep myself occupied or, yeah, yeah. or to be busy, you know? And again, that's very difficult if you don't have anything else to do, you know, between 8 a.m. And, and 1 p.m. or whatever, right? You, you have to occupy your time with something else, but it's necessary for long-term uh, success. Yeah. Do you watch MMA ever? Yeah. Yeah, man. I was okay. actually, so I was watching, uh, have you seen the device? This is like a two part series where they, they went to, and covered the, um, the original, uh, UFC. No. Uh, oh, it's so, on so, Vice? Yeah, it's on vice. Check, so check it out. Cause it's cool because that, that's how old I am. So I saw the first ones on like when they were being passed around on videotape, like VHS back in the day. So wow. I was watching Hoist and Shamrock and all those guys on VHS tape when I was in college. Um, and Vice did a cool special where they they interviewed uh, Ken Shamrock and his brother uh, Frank Shamrock, and they talk about how the origins of the UFC and then how eventually it ended up in the hands of Dana White and the the guys in Vegas. It's really cool. I didn't like it. Some of the stuff I knew, but a lot I didn't know. It's cool. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. I cut you off. Yes. No, the, uh, the reason I, I brought it up, you were just talking about like month end, year end and, and not like sacrificing maybe the future on the, you know, on what happens today. Um, I, I was hearing a commentary and they were talking about Sugar Sean O'Malley, just kind of his um, career path that he's on. And one of the things they said is he never fights for tonight. 
he fights tonight, but it's always in a, in, he's very smart and it's always with where is this fight going to take me? What will this fight do for my future? And I had this idea with, with if trading of just, it's so easy to slip into trading for the next trade and, and trading for today. And we got to be in our trades today, but we need to be in our trades with the understanding that this is going to allow me to survive down the road. And, and where is this going to push my career forward? Um, as opposed to putting so much emphasis on what happens on the very next trade or just on any one given day. Right. Uh, I think a lot of wisdom in that. It's nice. Uh, you know, and that's, nice again, that, that just comes back to hardwiring in our brains. Like nobody yeah. wants to be wrong. Um, yep. you never, you know, it, it, it irks you if you're wrong or if something, if something doesn't meet your expectations, right. And that sure. goes for whatever point in life. So yeah, you, you want to, uh, you want to view it from that perspective and, and also kind of think of it from the perspective of, um, if you can just cut one loss a week, add up how much that is at the end of the year, whatever. So whatever your normal, giveaway is right so like if even like a, even somebody's trading only let's say for 50 bucks a, a, a tick or whatever 50 bucks a trade right and you either make it or lose it um small account whatever and but there are some trades throughout the week where you just know that you shouldn't be in the trade and you're going you're giving away 50 dollars for no reason right that's like 200 bucks a month that's 2400 bucks a year on a very small account trading a very small size that's that's a lot you know that's a that's a month of a rent or that's a vacation or whatever um and so as you scale that those numbers grow substantially so if if you start trading for two or three four hundred dollars a tick um and you just cut one loss a week i mean you literally could be saving yourself a thousand dollars a week or more just by exercising a little more discipline you know, yeah, you're going to push some trades here and there, but just that one time where you know you should not be taking the trade, it doesn't seem like much because on that day, it's only 200 bucks. But at yeah. the end of the year, you know, at the end of the year, it costs you 5000 So it's especially deceptive if you're up $400 on the day. Yep. But that $200 is still, yep. that exactly. still happened. Mm. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. We're, I, I've kept you for a while. One last question sure. before uh, I let you go. Um, you just, we were just talking about the last thing I asked you is best thing you could recommend off the screens to help your performance. Um, what would you say is like the, the best thing you could do actually on the screens to help your trading performance? So uh, obviously watching the ladders, even, even if they're very thin and fast, um, watching the order book and the volume profile, so you know how much is trading at every price, aggregate the aggregate amount. Um, so, and as, as much time as you can doing that for sure. Uh, but also on the screen, I would highly recommend reading up everything you can find on um, guys that have been successful, that were uh, scalpers, floor traders, even though floors don't exist. So like the floor trading is now on the screen. So it's the same thing but it's just the HFTs are replicating what floor traders were doing. And of course, HFTs can do it in milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So read up everything you can about the floor trading, high frequency trading, um, you know, how these firms kind of run programs, the, the market making tactics, like, cause that really is what matters, right? And all this order flow, it's kind of a side note, but you'll, you'll probably appreciate it. Um, they're selling like brokers sell order flow to market makers. So for example, a lot of order flow is sold to Citadel and Citadel is a, they're a beast. Now they are monstrous. The, uh, the guy that runs Citadel made like two and a half billion dollars last year, just for him. That's, that was his salary with bonuses and everything. Oh <clears throat> so the reason I mentioned this is because all these people going through, you know, Robinhood and various other um, brokers, a lot of this flow is being sold to Citadel or Virtu, uh, I'm sure some to Goldman or whatever. So you have to ask yourself, why would they be willing to pay for order flow, right? Mm -hmm. 
So if you're buying, that means someone's selling to you. Frequently, the person selling to you is a market maker. Why is a market maker selling to me at these prices? Like if I think it's going up, why? Now there's could be various reasons for that. It could, it could be a part of a hedge or something, you know, maybe he's, he's got an options position that he has to hedge against or something. Not to digress, but the point being, spend zero time reading about technical analysis and trend lines and head and shoulders and spend, spend all your time reading uh, up on how big institutions operate and like try and watch some of these. Uh, there's some good documentaries. There's, um, I actually have a Twitter. I don't post on, I tw post on Twitter about as much as YouTube, but recently I posted on Twitter an old interview with um, Kramer. Kramer, is that the guy on? on Jim Kramer? Yes? Jim Kramer, yeah. Yeah. So I didn't realize this. Jim Kramer used to run a fund. And huh. this interview is from, I think, 07 or 06 or something. And he outright, like, the stuff he does on TV is nonsense for the most part because it's performance theater. But he talks about when he was running his fund, how he would commit a certain amount of capital to running the futures overnight so that he could cause a gap open in the morning to improve his positions that he might be taking on. He talks about leaking information to news sources. And he's like, it's a gray line, but it's legal. Or at least it was back then. Uh -huh. So as a retail trader, you, you at least need to be aware that that stuff takes place, mm. right? Because it gives you some insight into why you're seeing the behavior that you're seeing. You know, yeah. and, and, and I think a good example of this is like this oil thing lately. Obviously, the initial burst was pretty simple to see because of the, the Russia-Ukraine um, debacle. <clears throat> but at its height, all these guys were on TV, people in the energy industry were on TV talking about, oh, so there's going to be a shortage of oil and the prices are going to be higher and we, we have no refineries in the U.S. And, and yet. And like the entire world was convinced, maybe not the entire world, but a lot of people were convinced oil was about to go to 150. Mm -hmm. And instead, where did it, what happened to it? Drops mm -hmm. all the way back below 100. You know, you trade it, right? No hard evidence, but let's just say that was probably orchestrated. Yeah. Like that, those interviews were orchestrated. They were planned. There was, there was something there that was known. And this is a way that you can offload at least some of your size at the mm -hmm. high prices because you know prices are about to go down i mean it's not yeah it, it's and yeah, just for clarification when you say it's orchestrated the actual news events and the, the yes. talking heads talking, the talking about heads. it yeah the talking uh -huh. heads you know i mean i won't I, I wouldn't you know i guess go on record as saying that you know legally obviously i don't have the evidence but yeah being as old as i am let's just say i've seen stuff like that many many times you know mm -hmm. so it's the whole yep. buy buy the rumor sell the fact you know yeah adage right so yep. anyway hopefully that that helps great really great even those closing words of uh why are these people paying for liquidity and why or why is this market maker selling to me at this price it's just like a nice thought to think in the back of your mind when you're right. uh, getting ready to make a move yeah and and Period. don't let it cause peril you know paralysis but yeah. again that's why price action matters so if if the liquidity is there and the moves are strong, the market maker is not going to be willing to sell to you or sell as much. But if the liquidity is not there and they know that the chances of them getting run over are very slim and they can just average in or they can just outright manipulate price by, by spoofing and pulling bids and offers, it's very, very difficult to um, win in the short term. If for short term being like next say five minutes to 30 minutes sometimes like if that's all that's happening you you're probably just going to get chopped up or a best break even they're not going to yeah. pay you really nice cool, okay dude. awesome i uh i appreciate the length of time you spent with us i know we've gone over and uh that's all right I mean, chop it up it. however you want it it's fine whatever works for the the podcast and uh hey it's really nice to meet you man you, you seem like a cool guy so if you're in Florida or out west, call me or something. Hook up. I appreciate that. Before yeah. I actually let you go, before everybody else goes, um, is there anything that you would like to kind of plug or push people to? Is there anything you're involved with currently that you'd uh, 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 you know like to give a shout to? 
Um, just my site, which is uh, still nobsdaytrading.com. Um, yep. And I have, you know, like I have a basic course that's $85. It's extraordinarily cheap with a ton of information. And I always tell people like that, that'll get you going and you'll know. Either you want to keep going after that or you don't. Um, and then I have another course that's kind of an intermediate course. And then a couple of times a year, I will actually run a live webinar um, where I'll trade live. Uh, again, there's no, no recommendations being made, but I'll show people what I'm doing live for two weeks. Um, and that comes with a whole bunch of like 35 videos that go before that. And then two weeks of live trading and all that good stuff. So I, I try to make it, you know, I try to be as upfront as possible where in the sense of, there's no guarantees, um, but I, you know, I, it shaves a lot of time off of your learning curve, and you know, you'll the stuff that I teach took me years to learn. So you you have the benefit of you know a decade yeah. of experience, more than that now, but um, in in you know a few weeks of instruction, and then you still have to spend a lot of time watching the screen. So thanks for that. Awesome. Okay. So no BS day trading, uh, dot com and yep. also the YouTube yep. channel. If you want to YouTube, same thing, no BS day trading. If you, you want to take a dust, get the dust off a little <laughs> bit and hit the, <laughs> hit the subscribe button and uh, maybe you'll come back one of these days. I will. I will. Twitter too. No BS day trading at Twitter. Um, occasionally sure. I do some posts like that, which are, you know, kind of like that Jim Cramer video is interesting. So. Awesome. Right. Well, once again, I just want to say um, a big thank you. I'll kind of let everybody else go and then I'll say goodbye to you after. But sure. Um, sure. for everybody watching, thanks for tuning in for the uh, the entirety of the time. If you're still here, um, a big thanks to No BS Day Trading, uh, you know, John Grady for being here. And I uh, hope you all enjoy. I'll see you guys on the next one. Uh, let's all share some love on the way out. Hit the like button, do whatever you do. And we'll catch you guys on the next one. Thanks a lot, everybody. Goodbye. Hey, thanks for watching to the very end. If you enjoyed this episode, there's a good chance you're going to love the other ones. So spend some time on the channel and make sure you show some love on the way out. Now, if you're struggling with your trading and you'd like my help, everything I'm involved with will be linked in the descriptions. Happy trading.